this computer. Okay. Um, welcome, everyone. Ooh, we lost your audio there. Okay. Can you guys hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, good evening, everybody. I'm Tiffany Farrell. Uh, I'm the president of Southern Maryland Audubon Society, for those of you who haven't met me before. Um, it's the start of a new program year, and fall migration is underway. I saw an American red star in my yard today, um, so it's another exciting time of year. Um, I hope all of you are staying safe uh, amid the pandemic. Um, even though I have stayed close to home this summer, um, I've had a wonderful time observing our nesting birds as part of the Breeding Bird Atlas. Um, ah, we still have some people joining, it looks like. Um, I'll be giving a quick tutorial on Zoom for those of you who aren't familiar yet. Um, but just know that this is our very first um, public meeting. Uh, via Zoom. So I thank you guys for your patience as we learn the new technology. Um, and this experience is going to be a little different from our in-person meetings. Uh, some of you, like I say, might actually be using Zoom for the first time. So I'll go over just a couple of the quick tools we have on our Zoom screens. Um, today, of course, we have a guest speaker. So I'd like to ask that um, for the first part of the program, that everyone turn off their microphones. Um, now you would get to your microphone by hovering over the lower part of your Zoom screen, and you should see a microphone little icon that you can mute. And that way, uh, we won't be interrupting our speaker. Um, so if you wouldn't mind just turning off all of your microphones now. Um, we also would still like the, in, the presentation to be interactive. So group, uh, Zoom has this tool called group chat. So at the bottom of your screen, you should see a little chat icon. And if you click on that, it'll bring up a, a little chat small window. And you can, while our speaker is talking, actually type in your questions over here in the group chat box. And you can type them at any time during the presentation, but we won't actually answer them till the end. Um, but this way you can just ask questions as you're thinking about them. Um, every attendee also has on the bottom a share screen option. Um, and I'm just making you aware of it, so hopefully no one accidentally clicks on it because we're going to have our speaker actually sharing her screen and we don't want to hijack her presentation. And um, I have started a recording of the program tonight already. And just so you know that by participating, you are agreeing to having this recording made and for it to be posted on our website later. Um, of course, you can always turn off your camera, uh, just like you can turn off your microphone with the, the video icon at the bottom. Um, so one other quick mention here, um, if you lose your connection during the meeting, you can always rejoin by just clicking on the same link that we sent you guys through the invitation. And if you have any other questions um, that come up during the meeting, you can just go ahead and type them in the chat. I'll do my best to answer them as we go through. Um, but I think that should be, ooh, what happened there? <laughs> I think that's, I think that's uh, it for the little Zoom intro. Um, if this were an in-person meeting, we would normally start with announcements for the members and the public about what we're doing. Um, as most of you already know, uh, because of the continuing pandemic, our Southern Maryland Audubon Society field trip leaders decided to cancel all of our field trips for the fall season. It was a really hard decision for everyone, um, but we really had to keep everyone's health and safety foremost. Um, we're, but we're trying to find new ways of serving everyone. 
um, during this really difficult time. One of them is to, of course, have these um, virtual meetings and just have our speakers address everyone online. So I'm hoping this works out for everybody. Um, but I'd like to give you another quick summary of what else we've been up to. Um, this summer, we redesigned and relaunched our website for Southern Maryland Audubon. It's somdaudubon.org, which is the same URL that we had before. Um, the site now just contains a lot more information in a mobile-friendly environment, and it has lots more high-impact photographs, um, also made by our members and friends, and um, I hope you guys will find it really helpful. Um, we've also applied for several grants that involve COVID-friendly activities, and as soon as those decisions are made about awards, we'll let you know. Um, we also are happy to announce that we've donated money to a new scholarship fund for Black and Latinx birders through the Maryland Bird Conservation Partnership. So, um, in terms of our speaker programs, I'd like to let you know what else is coming up. Uh, first of all, keep checking our website because we're still adding more speakers. Um, it's been a little bit harder to organize this part uh, so far. So um, we, we are hoping we're going to be able to have more than one per month. But we do have lined up for October 7th, uh, Chris Eberly from the Maryland Bird Conservation Partnership. And he will be speaking on the Farmland Raptor Program that tries to conserve barn owls and American kestrels. On November 4th, we're going to have Dr. Amanda Gallinat, who will talk about climate change in birds, uh, specifically migratory birds and invasive plants. So it's going to be very, very interesting. Um, tonight, we have the pleasure of welcoming Karen Brace of Awesome Possums. She has been a licensed wildlife rehabilitator in Virginia for almost 10 years. And she specialized in squirrels and groundhogs until about three years ago when someone brought her a box of 11 possum joeys. That's when her love affair with the Virginia opossum began. She started the nonprofit Awesome Possums in 2019 with her ambassador, Possum Stewart, who is going to be joining us tonight along with her. Uh, awesome Possums is dedicated to educating the public about the U.S. and Canada's only native marsupial. Welcome, Karen. Thank you so much. All right. Are you ready for me to be your guinea pig here? Of course. You guys are actually my guinea pig as well because I need to learn how to do this as well. So, all right. Excellent. Can everybody see my screen okay? Yep, I see it. All right. Well, Tiffany just took some of my thunder. I was about to explain how everything began. This is really strange, not having an actual, I feel like a weirdo just talking to my computer. So let me just adjust a little here. Um, right, about three years ago, somebody brought me a box of 11 possums, little tiny. This was actually one of the ones in the box. And I had always wanted to work with possums. I just had never taken the time really to learn until I was handed a box of 11. And I realized how adorable they are. And as I started learning more and more and more about them, uh, I was, they're, they're just fascinating creatures. And uh, so that's sort of how the love affair began. Let's start off with some possum myths. It is a myth that they carry rabies. Now there's a difference between being able to contract rabies and actually carrying rabies. As I'm sure many of you are aware, there are rabies vector species out there, foxes, skunks, um, bats, and I always forget the last one, foxes, skunk, bats, there's one more I'm missing, um, that, or raccoons, sorry, that actually can be carriers of the rabies virus, but not actually be symptomatic. So that, that constitutes what's called a rabies vector species. Possums are not rabies vector species. They don't carry rabies, <clears throat> excuse me. However, they can contract it 
if they are bitten by a rabid animal. Now they have, and we'll talk about this a little bit later on, they are extremely resistant to rabies due to a low body temperature. So there, it is also a myth that they can't get rabies. That is not true. Any warm blooded mammal can contract it. They're just very resistant to it. Number two, if seen out during the day, they must be sick. This is true <clears throat> of, this myth is true of foxes, raccoons, a lot of wild animals that are nocturnal. If people see them out during the day, they think they, they must be sick or something's wrong with them. And people get concerned that, oh, the animal must have rabies. Whereas that can, that can be true, most of the time it's in the spring and the summer and nine times out of 10, the animal that you see is a mom, is a hungry mom caring for babies, either pregnant or she has babies stashed somewhere. So um, just because a wild animal that is normally nocturnal is out during the day, not necessarily sick. Another myth is that possums are dirty and diseased ridden. They are actually extremely clean animals. They are a lot like cats. If they're not eating or sleeping, they spend most of their time grooming. Another myth is that they are aggressive and vicious animals. By nature, possums are extremely docile animals. They want to get away from you. When you approach them, if you startle them, if you corner them, they will puff up, show their teeth. We'll talk about other defense mechanisms, but for the most part, they're very docile. They just want to get away from you, do their own thing. Now, that being said, I have had a few little ones who had uh, every opportunity and they took it to try and take a chunk out of me. So uh, possums and most animals are a lot like people. Some are just nicer than others. Another myth is that they hang by their tails to sleep. This is not true. As you will see a little bit further in the presentations, the babies can kind of hang from their tails a little bit, um, especially as they're learning to climb and fall. They wrap their tails around things. But the tails, especially in the adults, are not strong enough to actually support them. And they certainly do not sleep hanging from by their tails. Possums sleep generally flat on their back with their feet up in the air. And when they sleep, they are out cold. So if they had to hang by their tails, they would probably land on their faces most of the time. Another myth is that they are stupid. Their brain in comparison to other mammals is extremely small, which is how this myth was perpetuated. Um, the smaller the brain, it's thought the, the less the amount of intelligence. Not actually true. They are, have been tested and rate higher in intelligence when it comes to finding food than cats, rats, and pigs, which are supposed to be the you know, the three smartest animals when it comes to food. So they are not stupid. Uh, most of their brain is just uh, related to their olfactory sense, their nose, and their sense of uh, trying to find food. So their intelligence is pretty much <laughs> sur surrounds those, uh, those things. Now you've probably caught on that I keep saying possum versus opossum. Oh, now, Stuart and his brethren are Virginia opossums. And this name came about in 1608 when Captain John Smith called the critters he came across opossums. It's the Algonquin term meaning white animal or white dog. And he quoted in his journal, an opossum hath a head like a swine and a tail like a rat and is the big, has the bigness of a cat. Under her belly she hath a bag where she lodgeth carrieth and sucketh her young. Try saying that five times fast. Now, I happen to think that the word opossum sounds oh silly and I refuse to say it. So the term possum, dropping the O, is an approved slang term. You have some hardcore people out there who will not say possum and call them by their appropriate names, tomato, tomato. Now there are actually true possums out there, but they're all in Australia, New Zealand, and New Guinea. 
They are actually called possums, not opossums. Australia alone has 27 species of possums. And I should have updated this slide with a picture of the pygmy possum, which is about the size of your thumb. And I really think that I need to obtain one. Now, most of you are probably aware that um, possums or opossums are marsupials. That is, they carry their babies in a pouch, which makes them related to kangaroos, koala bears, wombats, and Tasmanian devils. They're all cousins. That's pretty much where the similarities end. Now, possums have been around for 70 million years. They were around at the time of the dinosaurs. There were many, many, many other species of animals along uh, that were alive at the time of the dinosaurs that have become extinct. The question is, how have they managed to survive so long? Well, if you ask me, there are several reasons. Rule number one, if you want to outlive the dinosaurs, is don't be fussy. Eat everything. Possums will eat ticks, snails, slugs, which is great for the gardeners out there, bird eggs, frogs, mice, snakes. They do love a good chicken dinner. Plants, fruit, grains, carrion, so they help uh, clean up the environment, eat all the dead things that we don't want to see out there. They will get into human food. Uh, if you leave dog or cat food out there, they will participate uh, and help themselves in that. They will get into bird feeders, they eat frogs, and you may have noticed I have ticks there twice. Possums can eat four to five, not 45, four to 5,000 ticks in one season. They do this because they are efficient, exceptionally efficient at grooming. So as they're roaming around at night, getting covered in ticks, because especially in Virginia, that's what happens when you're outside. Uh, then when they go back to wherever they're gonna hole up for the day, they groom themselves. And they're able to get about 95% of the ticks off of themselves and have a little tick meal. Rule number two, be a great actor. Possums have a very interesting defense mechanism. If you've heard the expression playing possum, that is exactly what they do. And they really, this is not a dead possum on the screen. This is one who is playing possum. And how they do that is, if you're a possum and a predator approaches you and you cannot get away, the first thing you do is you puff up like a scary cat and hiss. They will show their teeth all 50 of their teeth, by the way, it can look pretty intimidating. They'll start to drool, act a little crazy. This is to make the predator think that they're sick. Nobody wants to eat anything that's sick. If that doesn't work, work they admit a foul smelling odor from their butt. And believe me, it is like, if anybody has dogs, that anal gland smell, that you just, you can smell from across the room combined with death. That's pretty much, it's a green, oily, viscous substance. Uh, I have had the pleasure of having it on me a few times when I've had to wrangle older possums. It is not something you want to be around. Then they stagger and they fall over again, making themselves look sick. Their eyes roll back into their head. They actually get stiff. You can pick them up and they will feel still warm, but they do get stiff. And it's interesting that their heart rate drops to just a few beats per minute. So if you, they look dead, they feel dead, they smell dead, most predators are gonna take one look at that and think, nope, I'm gonna go find a meal elsewhere. The possum will wait for the danger to pass and then hop up and continue on its merry way. Now the mystery is, scientists cannot figure out that this is a completely involuntary response. The possum has no control over this. And sometimes they'll go from puff up and hiss like a cat to falling over all in, in one. They don't always, depending on how startled they get, sort of like a fainting goat. Um, they don't always exhibit all of these things. They can go from zero to 60 and just boom. And, uh, but the mystery is nobody knows how the possum knows when the danger is passed. They're completely unconscious. So they must have some sort of sense 
that alerts them to the danger being gone and they hop up and continue on their way. Rule number three, keep your head down, keep moving, don't make waves. Possums are nomadic, they keep moving, they don't have family units, uh, males and females don't stick together, the babies don't stick with mom after more than about four, four and a half months, so they don't have a territory to defend. That is important. If you just keep, if you keep your bags packed and you just keep moving, you, you don't have that territory that, uh, that you don't have to defend, which means if something happens to that territory, you just move on, no big deal. Rule number four, don't reinvent the wheel. As you see from the little guy in the chiminea over on the right, he didn't build that. They don't build anything. They don't build a den, they don't build a nest. Uh, they don't hollow out a tree. They don't dig a hole under your deck. They don't rip the siding off of your house and move into your attic. That would be squirrels and raccoons. They will pretty much go wherever they can go that is already made, whether it's uh, a hole in a tree that a raccoon has dug out and abandoned, a hole under a shed, uh, or a old groundhog burrow. Now if there is a hole in your siding and they can get into your attic, they're excellent climbers. They'll be happy to climb up the tree, jump onto your roof, and make themselves a little uh, home in your insulation in your attic. But uh, they don't actually dig uh, or build anything. Rule number five, develop superpowers. I had mentioned that they eat ticks, thousands and thousands of them every single year. However, they do not contract any tick-borne diseases. No ehrlichia, no tularemia, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, Lyme disease. They don't get any of it. I also mentioned that they are extremely resistant to the rabies virus because their body temperature is about 94 to 95 degrees which is a huge difference from most other wild animals. Uh, squirrels have a body temperature of 104, so that is a nine to 10 degree difference between the two animals that makes them resistant to a lot of different things. They are also, another superpower, is that they are also immune to most native snake venom. So out here, it would be copperheads, for example, they're immune to. They have a molecule in their blood that neutralizes snake venom. Now, notice I said they are immune to most snake venom. The exception is a coral snake. And the reason for that is coral snakes, their venom is a neurotoxin that affects the neurological system. Now, notice I just said that the possums have a molecule in their blood that neutralizes snake venom. So copperheads, their venom is a hemotoxin, which affects the blood. So coral snakes are different with their neurotoxin. Uh, there's nothing in the possum that prevents it from reacting to nervous system type issues. And rule number six, have a bazillion babies. Let's talk about those babies. This is one of my favorite pictures. When they get, uh, these guys, believe it or not, are about almost three months old. Most people would guess that they're only a few weeks old, but we'll talk about that. Because for a mama possum, gestation is only 13 to 14 days. That is not a typo. Tiny little jelly beans make their way down from the birth canal into the pouch, which is called a marsupium, which means double womb, hence marsupial. Now you can see in the, in the spoon, little tiny fetuses. When the joeys are born, they are fetuses. Possums are non-placental mammals. So they are not, sorry, Stuart just did something very rude in the dog bed next to me. I hope you guys didn't hear that. Um, they are non-placental animals, so they don't obviously have a placenta. So when 
the babies are in the uterus, they're kind of just kicking around. There's nothing holding them in there, kind of like dot, uh, dice in a Yahtzee cup. Because they are not physically attached by an umbilical cord in non-placental animals, mom's body actually thinks that they are foreign bodies. And come day 13 or 14, they are expelled from her body, which is sort of a harsh way to start life. So you can see that they are totally unformed. Now, obviously, if we were to get a mom who'd been hip in the road and we got joeys like this, there's absolutely, I mean, these guys are literally the size of honeybees. There's nothing we can do. You can't get a tube in them. You can't feed them. Nothing. Um, so you see down at the bottom right, a lot of people think that that is a pregnant possum, but she has actually given birth and has a pouch full of babies. Like that. I'm going to give you a moment to, uh, I can see some of your faces and some of the reactions from that video, the, from that picture was, was pretty funny. So what starts is just a tiny little slit that is a pouch will grow and grow and grow, sort of how a human mom will have a, you know, eight, nine, 10 pound sometimes baby. It just sort of stretches to accommodate things. So at zero to eight weeks, the babies are in the pouch full time attached to mom. And they do this because mom has sort of freakishly long nipples. And the babies will, the fetuses go into the pouch attached to the long nipples that go down almost into their stomach. And she basically tube feeds them. So that nipple acts as the umbilical cord would in a placental mammal. They are getting a constant drip, drip, drip of formula. They're getting the antibodies. They're getting everything that they need to grow up and be strong possums. Now, because of that, they do not have a suck reflex like kittens, puppies, squirrels, bunnies, humans. Most mammals have a suck reflex. Possums do not, so we have to tube feed them. And sometimes, as in the case of this little feller right here, hopefully this will play, you guys can see that baby possums are punks. He just wants no part of that tube and is using his back feet to just become a little, little punk. So when you have 30 or 40 of these little guys and it's three in the morning and you're trying to feed them, that is not nearly as cute as it is right there. So when they get to be about eight weeks old, their mouth size, they leave the pouch, their eyes start to open. 12 weeks, they start to crawl around mom, like that picture you saw right around on her back. 16 weeks, they leave mom a little bit longer to forage, and then they eventually go off on their own once they're about a pound. So let's talk about Lulu. This is Lulu. She came to me. Uh, she'd been hit by a car. She's a full, full grown adult female. She had been hit by a car back in February, spent uh, some time getting uh, cared for by another rehabber, and it was discovered that she had babies. So she came to me mid March, and I got the amazing privilege and opportunity to watch her raise her babies. And I have a couple of quick videos of what it actually, this was amazing. I mean, look at all the little feet, the little hands, the little tails. She had seven. Um, and she didn't really appreciate me being anywhere around her babies, as you can tell from the look on her face. She is completely blind in both eyes uh, from the accident. Her left or right eye is damaged and the other one has a cataract or something. So she is just, just blind, but she was a great, great mom. And as the babies got older, you can see they started to climb around on her. Generally be irritating as kids will look at the look on her face. She's like, really get off me. They just started to be Pesky, pesky kids. And again, I was pretty much hands off. She wanted me nowhere around those babies. As you can see, again, kids doing what kids do. She taught them how to eat out of a bowl. If 
you can hear the slurping. She taught them what it was like to be a big possum. We had a family portrait. Although there's only four there, like I said, she had seven. It was Lulu and the seven dwarfs, but I thought this was uh, adorable. She was such a good mom. I had a hard time when it came time for me to start taking her babies from her. I thought she was gonna be traumatized. I was like, how can I do this? How can I take babies from a mother? She is going to hate me. Well, I was looking at the whole process from a human point of view, not a wildlife point of view. So I kept the babies with her probably a couple of weeks longer than nature would have kept them with her. I snuck them a few at a time, put them in an outdoor cage where I let them continue to feed them. Obviously they were totally weaned at this time and uh, continued to feed them, got them to be about two pounds and then release them. But I'd sneak a few out every day just so she wouldn't notice. And I thought she was going to be so traumatized. And when the last one was gone, this is what I saw. She was finally able to sleep peacefully after two months. Can you imagine two months of not even being able to go to the bathroom by yourself without kids, literally kids hanging on you. And she has adjusted to life as a house possum quite nicely, thank you very much. So thank you, Lulu, for the opportunity to watch that amazing process. So let's talk possum anatomy. I did mention that they are extremely docile, non-aggressive creatures. That doesn't mean that if they are not cornered, that if they're cornered, they will not use those 50 razor sharp teeth. Incidentally, that is the most teeth of any mammal. Even the little puffball guy down at the bottom, um, most of the time the babies just puff up and he is in a full puff right there. The babies puff up and it's mostly bluff and bluster, but they can pack a, a pretty good pinch too sometimes. But I have handled full grown adult males with teeth like the big guy here who have had every opportunity to turn around and take a chunk out of me and they have not taken it. So. They really are just amazing, amazingly docile little animals. Now, if you look at the eye of a possum, they look just jet black and shiny. And what you're seeing is dilated pupils. They're nocturnal animals. So their eyes have adapted to the dark. And, um, so they, they do have irises, you just can't really see them because all you're seeing is really pupil. They have eh, okay vision during the day, sort of like when you go to the doc, eye doctor, have your eyes dilated and you walk out into the sunlight and you can't see anything, you can't drive, everything's blurry, sort of like that. But the nighttime obviously is where they excel. They have a rod to cone ratio in their eyes of 50 to one. Cats only have a 10 to one ratio, and we, we tend to think of cats of, as having excellent night vision. Well, possums have five times better night vision. Now, sometimes on the internet, you'll see you know, people posting what is supposed to be a cute picture of a cross-eyed possum. The cross-eyed look actually comes from fat deposits behind the eyeballs that, is, that are pushing the, eye, the pupils over. So this is actually an extremely obese possum. They don't live that long in the wild or captivity. They are prone to cardiovascular disease and the, the one thing that they should never be is extremely overweight. A lot of people that have them as pets, uh, you know, again, think this look is cute and it's fun to feed them because they eat everything, but it's extremely important for captive possums uh, like Stuart and the crew here at Awesome Possums to, uh, to keep them in, in good shape. They have five little fingers on their front feet and you'll notice they have an opposable thumb on their back feet. That helps primarily for climbing and gripping. That's how they can walk along fences, they can climb trees, they can do all sorts of uh, 
acrobatic maneuvers. It's because of those little thumbs. And they also have prehensile tails like monkeys, so they can use it as a fifth limb. It's used for balance, gripping. They also carry things. Um, in the wild, moms will uh, gather leaves. Well, in the winter, moms and dads, you know, males and females both gather leaves, gather a uh, newspaper, gather whatever they can to stuff into whatever little crack or crevice they have found. And they do that by wrapping their tails. They kind of scoot everything with their butts and their feet, and then they wrap their tails underneath it and lift the whole little bundle up. So in the wild, their tails are extremely important. Not only do they use them for balance and gripping um, and carrying things. So what happens if the tail is damaged or lost? In the wild, the possum, um, it, most of them don't make their first year anyway. That's why mom has so many. But if they lose their tails, they're in an extreme, extreme, um, it's, a, it's a detriment to them and um, most of them will not survive. However, if you are part of Awesome Possums and you have lost your tail or have lost your tail and then become part of Awesome Possums, you become a spoiled little princess named Bobby Sue. I see you guys laughing at her tutu. She is very sensitive about her tutu. She came to me last November. Her tail had been chewed off by a litter mate. And uh, if possums get stressed or um, overcrowded, they will sometimes cannibalize. Um, I thought the ex I thought the conditions had to be really, really extreme for this to happen, although Two weeks ago, I actually had it happen, and I have another tailless female who um, lost not quite that much, but almost uh, her tail to siblings who just lost their minds and chewed it off. So you will, uh, if you follow uh, Awesome Possums on Facebook or Instagram, you will see Sweet Pea coming up through the ranks. Um, so Bobby Sue is uh, not quite as experienced as Stuart, but she had her debut in February where we had matching tutus. You would not believe the amount of people that came out to see Bobby Sue's debut. Since then, she has played pinball uh, and has appeared um, on a group called Cats on Pins, where people put their cats on pinball machines. So somebody reached out to me and thought it would be fun to have a trash cat on pins. She has gotten to pee in a Tesla. I've never even gotten to drive a Tesla. Bobby Sue got to pee in one. That's a long story. She has her very own line of candy, Bobby Sue Poo. And she has had many a photo shoot. That's how weird my life is. So, Getting back to some serious possum anatomy here. Both males and females have cloacas. You guys are bird people. You know what a cloaca is. Basically what I tell people is the pee and the poop comes out of the same place, which is fine if you're a bird, but it's extremely weird if you are a mammal. And when I was learning to rehab possums with baby anything, if it's too young, it doesn't uh, go to the bathroom by itself. So you have to, what we call, stimulate it. You know, mama dogs do it to puppies, cats do it to kittens. Um, you just kind of rub that area and stimulate them to go to the bathroom. So can you imagine my surprise when everything was coming out of the exact same place on possums? It was a very, it was a, it was a learning experience. Like I said, I've learned a lot about possums. But here is a super weird alert. Super weird alert, and I cannot wait to see the faces. Males have a forked or a bifed penis. Just going to give you a second to let that thing sink in. That is, and it pops out of the cloaca, which is even stranger. Uh, I have a friend who has a theory uh, how possums got on earth he said he said he truly believes 70 million years ago a spaceship full of possums crash landed on the earth and that's how we got them they are very very strange little animals but it gets even weirder 
Now take a look at this. I don't know if you guys can see my pointer here. One uterus, two uteruses, uteri, uteruses, however you call it. You think that's weird. Check this out. One lateral vagina, two lateral vaginas, a third vagina. And I think you guys should work this into conversation, a vaginal cul-de-sac. Possums are very strange, but, whoops, the two uterus setup is what allows them to birth up to 20 babies at a time, sort of a double oven, 10 here, 10 here. And then, so, the the sperm with the double penis this is making more sense now the sperm goes up here and it goes up here and then the babies come out of here and go down here sort of like a little divided highway so notice i said that they can have up to they can birth up to 20 babies there's a catch mom only has 13 nipples so the first 13 win Survival of the fittest right out of the starting gate. Just some quick facts here. Males are called Jacks, females are called Jills, and the babies are called Joeys. Uh, the average size of a, a female is about eight pounds, although my little uh, tutued Bobby Sue is weighing in at a whopping 5.4 pounds. So she's pretty small for a female. Or, yeah, female. The males can get up to 14 pounds. Stuart, post pre-COVID, was 11. I think he's put on a little extra weight, like a lot of us during this pandemic. They can reach up to three feet long with the tail at maturity. Stuart is probably right about there. Average lifespan in the wild is two years. Uh, a lot of them don't make their first year. Um, they are uh, have a lot of predators out there, of course. They're on their own at about a pound, which is just a tasty snack for an owl, hawk, an eagle, a fox, a coyote, a cat, a dog. Um, a lot of things like to eat baby possums. So, um, and you know, the winters are really hard because they have the hairless tails and the fingers and the little really, really thin ears. They're also very prone to frostbite. In captivity, their lifespan is only about four years. Some may go four and a half, but overall they just don't live very long. Heart rate is 180 to 240 beats a minute. And as I mentioned, their body temperature is 90 to 95. Usually we say 94, 95 degrees. So if you're still not convinced that possums are for you, there are some ways to get them out of your yard, although the amount of ticks they eat, I don't know why anybody would want them out of their yard. But these tricks also work for uh, raccoons, skunks, and uh, other wild animals. You got to keep the trash picked up, keep the lids on the trash cans, pick up dog, cat food at night, limit the feeding times if you feed ferals or outdoor cats, uh, feed at a certain time, then pick the food up. Make sure that you're closing the holes in your attic, sheds, decks, chimneys, anywhere where any creature can get in and make themselves a home. Keep compost in secure bins, keep barbecue areas clean. Uh, nothing attracts the smell of a little carnivore like uh, steak or freshly barbecued chicken. Make sure that you are uh, keeping your chickens and your ducks and your other poultry and uh, birds in secured pens and coops. Uh, possums and raccoons are both excellent climbers and like I mentioned before, they do love a good chicken dinner. Pick up any rotten fruit, vegetables that's attracting or attractive to them. Keep your garage doors shut and keep your pet doors locked at night. And as a you know i do this presentation for a lot of just general public so i know you guys are um, environmentally aware and you respect wild animals so i will just mention this real real quick a lot of people every year we get uh, baby squirrels possums um, that people have picked up and found when they're small they're adorable they're cute they're cuddly 
Uh, not only is it illegal, and again, these rules are the state of Virginia, um, I assume it's the same in Maryland, but not only is it illegal, it's dangerous to them and to you, and uh, especially to them, because wild animals require extremely special diets. Um, possums require a higher level of calcium than a lot of other wild babies. Feeding techniques, as I mentioned, they have to be tube fed in order to get the proper amount of nutrients into them. Uh, we actually tube feed bunnies for the same reason. Uh, they have habitat requirements and housing requirements. Then they do not make good pets. Everybody knows somebody that had a, uh, an uncle or a cousin or a brother or a grandpa or whatever that had a pet raccoon or squirrel. Okay, sometimes maybe you get one that's really docile, but for the most part, they don't make good pets. They know they are wild. If you, uh, for the people that are in Virginia anyway, if you find a baby XYZ, the Wild Life Rescue League helpline is a great resource, as is the Virginia Department of uh, Natural Resources or Wildlife Resources just changed from, um, they just changed the name and I haven't gotten used to it yet. Um, and if you're outside of Virginia, the Humane Society of the United States has a great resource right on their website, uh, how to find a wildlife rehabilitator in any state. So if I, you guys want to take a screenshot or snap a picture of this, great resources to, um, to have in case, you know, we're still in baby season. Um, and here's the Department of Natural Resources also has a wildlife conflict helpline. And the Humane Society of the United States has a great resource online called Wild Neighbors. It's how to um, deal with quote unquote nuisance animals. I think humans tend to be the ones that are nuisances, but that's just me. And this is me. This is Awesome Possums. Find us on Facebook and Instagram. You can even shop my very, very wacky online store. And uh, for those of you who are interested in other wildlife presentations, um, I have the ones that I have right now are um, Nuts About Squirrels, The Beauty of Bluebirds, Hummingbirds, Birds Are Weird, because birds are weird. Sorry, bird people, birds are really strange. And Ticks Suck. The presentations are $10 per presentation, i.e. $10 per person, um, although one registration throws as many people in the room as you want. Um, and then I say see the website for dates and times. It's not actually on the website yet. I am being optimistic. Um, but, you know, keep my number if you guys have any wildlife questions, if you know somebody whose school, garden club, community group, business wants to have us come out and uh, Stuart or Bobby Sue um, or my, uh, my two other um, education possums, Bruiser and Uncle Fester, who are new as of last week, just give me a holler. Now, before I introduce the star of the show, this was baby Stuart. Stuart just turned two in July. He came in uh, just over, uh, just under two years ago with his brother, Mickey. And uh, he, Stuart is, uh, they both had some health issues. They both had metabolic bone disease. They went through some stuff. Um, Stuart is non-releasable because he has no hip sockets. Although for those of you who have seen him, you will know that he can walk, he can run, he can climb. He does it because he's lazy and I cart him around in a pet stroller. But he can do all of those things. But he is non-releasable only because we do not want him to go back into the wild and have those wonky little genes reproducing in the wild and putting the animal at, um, you know, at a disadvantage. His brother Mickey on the right was not so lucky. At seven months old, he had extremely deformed elbows that were causing him a lot of pain. So we do not tell Stuart why his brother doesn't come to visit. So um, that is the scoop on Stuart. Um, if you guys want to ask questions, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And I'm going to get 
Stuart. Tiffany, can you, I think I stopped sharing, right? Yes, yes. Okay. I just had to unmute, sorry. Okay, um, I see yeah, a bird I, on the screen, so I'm not sure if you guys can still see me. I can see you, your face now, Okay. And the screen is gone. Um, so I think we can go to the next part of your presentation. Um, let, me get, let me get the big guy. While she's doing that, folks, um, could you think of your questions for Karen? Um, it sounds like she's had lots of other rehab experience too. Maybe you have some questions about animals other than the opossum. Oh, and here he is. Oh, there we go. Oh, big guy. It's kind of hard to get him all in the camera at once. Let's see if I can. <laughs> And I forgot I sit on an exercise ball, which isn't conducive to not having any hands, but here he is. Oh. And the, the beauty of doing these presentations in person is that people are actually allowed to touch him, pet him. They're a lot softer than you think they are. Uh, you know, when you see, of course, he's a lot better. He, well, not now. He's a little gnarly because he's been rolling around in the dog bed, but he's normally a lot better groomed than the possums you see in your trash and your let me see if i can get him a little closer here look that way Stu. look that way look that way there he is can you hear him sniffing so all right are we getting any questions oh we're gonna climb there we go you can see i heard the sniffing karen that's awesome old. The biz, big old tail. You can see it wrapping around. Coming around, coming around. And we're going down. <laughs> well, I, I don't see any questions yet in our group chat, Karen, but um, could you tell us what it's like to live with possums in your house? <laughs> Well, you should probably be asking my husband that. So I'm sure he's not looking in the door right now. Um, it's my life is very strange between going to possum photo shoots. Um, but it, it's amazing how many people reach out and just want to learn about them. Um, so it is really neat actually living with them. Here we go again. <laughs> And, uh, and he is 11 pounds and people ask me, aren't his claws sharp? Yes, yes they are. It's like having a 11 pound cat climb on you. Sorry about the view, everybody. Um, so Karen, uh, Julie Simpson asked if he uses a litter box. Um, litter boxes are for cats. Stuart is trained to a puppy pad. Um, <laughs> said tongue in cheek. He, let go. Um, fun fact about possums, they like to poop in the water when they're little, which I think is disgusting and I do not encourage. So I give them a little tiny water dish in their cage and then I give them a plastic pan and I put a very, when I'm talking about when they're babies, um, I put a very wet piece of paper towel or newspaper or something like that in the bottom of it. So then when the babies get to sniffing around and they go and their little feet hit the water, it, for whatever reason, stimulates them to go to the bathroom. And then as one goes, they all sort of figure out how to use the pan. So you saw how young Stuart was when I first got him. That's how he was raised, with the little potty pan with the wet paper towel. So as he got bigger and more used to going there, the pans got bigger, of course, and the paper towels got drier. So he has, he lives in an outdoor enclosure uh, most of the year, but when it gets really, really cold, I do bring him inside in my rehab area, which is my basement. And he gets to roam around the basement. And he has, uh, I just put a couple of puppy pads in the basement or in the bathroom of the rehab area. And he is about 99% reliable at going on his puppy pad. They, uh, like I said, they're extremely clean animals. He doesn't want to go potty anywhere near where his food is. Um, and if there is something on the puppy pad, he will go on the floor next to the puppy pad. A uh, lot like a, a cat will do if the litter box is dirty. So um, they are 
you know, very, very clean animals. They don't have a smell to them, sort of like cats don't really have much of an odor. Oh. Uh, not aware that they have dander or anything like that. They do shed. Um, I don't know if you could tell when I had Stuart on me that, oh, I think you're going to get the opportunity because he's coming back up, that he's kind of two-tone right now. You can see um, where the top half is white and then the bottom half is gray. He uh, is so lazy, he never finished molting in the spring. So uh, he's about to start, I think, the, the getting ready for the fall molt. So hopefully he uh, does a little bit better job of it this time. And here we go again. So Karen, someone else asked if he has claws that you need to clip. Yes, yes. Uh, you know, in the wild, their claws get, all right, I'm acting funny because he is hanging down my back and I'm supporting him. Um, get up there, buddy. There he comes. Um, in the wild, their claws would get filed down just by the fact that they, you know, walk two to three miles every night looking for, looking for food. Right in the ear, thank you. So Stuart is not uh, the most ambitious possum. So his claws do get razor sharp, just like a cat. And, uh, you know, I've had him for so long, he's sort of used to getting his claws clipped. He'll let me do it. He grumbles a little about it. Um, but for the, you know, he, he does pretty good. But, you know, even when you trim a cat's claws, they're still kind of sharp, especially when 11 pounds is digging into you like it is right now. Okay, here's another interesting question. Someone uses a live trap to relocate feral cats and once in a while catches a possum by mistake. Mm -hmm. Is it difficult to persuade them to get out of the trap during the day? And do you have any suggestions about that? Um, for the most part, no, they don't want to be in that trap. You should be able to open it and then leave and walk away. Um, if that doesn't work, and you can reach in and just touch their tail a little bit. That usually gets them to move. Uh, if it doesn't, you know, um, you can cover, well, I wouldn't cover the trap because then they'll just think it's a den. But uh, in my experience, anytime I have had to relocate, not relocate, but, um, you know, like I'm, I'm transporting, um, possums that are going to be released or I'm transporting one that has an older one that's been being cared for and then it's time to be released. Uh, they usually don't hesitate when it comes time to get out of a trap. Um, I'm glad you actually mentioned relocate though, although I don't think that was the, the question. A lot of people will relocate wildlife thinking that it is more humane than actually trapping and killing um, the animal. It is actually not humane at all because when you trap and relocate a raccoon or a squirrel or a possum or whatever, um, a lot of times you are actually condemning them to death. You are putting them in an area where they don't know where the food is, they don't have food stored, they don't know where to sleep, they don't know whose territory they're in. Excuse me, squirrels, for example, are extremely territorial. And if you dump a male squirrel in somebody else's territory, he's going to get his little fuzzy butt kicked. In the spring and the summer, 50% of those animals have babies. So if you are uh, trapping and relocating a female, you, um, you know, you're taking that mom away from her babies. So I have educated a lot of my uh, friends on the evils of trapping and relocating. Uh, the best thing to try to do is try you know learn to coexist with them and do a lot of the things that you know i suggested if you don't want them around a lot of people don't have an issue with possums and they want to feed them they put food out for them but of course it attracts raccoons foxes skunks as well um that not everybody wants to walk out into your front yard at night and come face to face with a skunk um understandably so you know, you, you sort of have to figure out what what animals you want to attract and then deal with the ones that just sort of come along for the ride. Sorry, that was a tangent. I squirreled. 
That's great. That's no problem at all, Karen. Um, I do have one other question that came directly to me rather than to the whole group. And that is, um, would Bobby Sue or any other female um, that has had young be able to work as a foster mother for abandoned babies? Excellent question. That was my goal when I got Lulu. Um, was that not necessarily a foster, um, but even a surrogate would have been amazing. I've heard that rehabbers have successfully had surrogate raccoons that have lost their babies and have, you know, you've, they've been able to place other ones with, with that mom and she has raised them. Um, so that was my goal, my hope when I got uh, Lulu. The problem with possums is it depends. Um, the young are, if the young are small enough, you have to get them in mom's pouch without mom knowing, which is tricky, especially with Lulu, because I did not handle her um, except to take her out occasionally just to clean the cage, put her back in for um, the month or so, five, six weeks that she had her baby. She was extremely protective. So there was no way I was sneaking anything in. And um, you can't just put a baby in because the mom is not going to recognize it as hers. It's going to smell different. She's not going to recognize it. So you always risk um, the you run the risk that they will kill the babies, which I've heard from other possum rehabbers that is exactly what they do. Unless you can get the new baby to smell like her babies and then sneak it in the pouch when she's sleeping. Um, and then of course, once uh, when Lulu's babies were um, weaned and I took them from her, she still had milk, obviously. Sorry, he's playing. Jungle monkey again here. Come on. <laughs> Come on, Stuart. Have a love, dude. Um, and I just didn't have any other babies uh, at that time, and then her milk dried up. So um, the very long answer to that short question is, it depends, but I've not heard that there's a great success rate with using possums as surrogates. Other animals, yes. Possums, yeah, not so much. So another question, Karen, is um, what do you feed your possums and do they like mealworms? Possums like just about anything. Um, you saw the, the list of food um, that I had up on the screen. And um, I try to feed mine a lot of the things that they would get in the wild. So they get um, mice. They get frozen mice, frozen thawed out mice. They get fruits and vegetables. Because they're in captivity um, and I want them to live longer and be healthier than normal possums, you know, possums in the wild, they also get um, yogurt for calcium. They get cheese. They get Stuart. <laughs> he's not used to me sitting down, so he's like, what is going on? Um, they get you know, a lot of other things that they wouldn't get in the wild. But it's not uncommon for me to be in the kitchen at 11 o'clock at night cooking scrambled eggs and chopping vegetables up really fine so that they eat them. They're a lot of like kids. Uh, Stuart will not eat a carrot. I don't care. Unless I puree it and mix it with other things, he will not eat a carrot. If I just chop them up and put them in his food, he will lick them clean and spit them all over his cage. Um, because he doesn't know he's supposed to be in the wild eating trash, I guess. So they, I try to give him a variety of things. Stuart's favorite thing in the world is kiwi. Lulu will take you down for banana. Um, you know, like people, they have their likes, they have their dislikes. Um, they all definitely have their favorites. Everybody loves scrambled eggs. Oh, everybody loves scrambled eggs. I don't know if you can see him, he's, he's being cute. My big trash bear. My big trash bear. Yes. Okay, I'm back. Any other questions? I don't see any others in 
uh, the chat box. And Carol, uh, no questions? I don't see any more. <laughs> <laughs> Julie, do you have any more questions of your own? Um, no, I'm good. This was yeah, fun. It was really fun. And I'm so jealous now that we didn't get to meet him in person. We'll have to come to some of your other events. Yeah, definitely. Um, if anybody is going to be around the Fredericksburg area, which is where we live, um, Stuart is going to be at uh, one of the best, dare I say the best, local donut places on Memorial Day. Um, it's Freddy Donuts, downtown Fredericksburg. It's 801 William Street. And uh, they have amazing donuts, if anybody has been there. It's a family uh, owned and operated. Um, and we will be there from uh, 11 to 2, um, along with all of the fun possum paraphernalia that I have to sell at events to uh, help with fundraising and things like that. So if anybody is out and about, um, there shouldn't be, there isn't usually a ton of people at any given time. It's not like, you know, we're not doing an actual presentation. It's just people come and meet him. Um, mm -hmm. People like to bring certain, he is, can you just see him? He is hanging upside down. <laughs> Karen, did you mean Labor Day, not Memorial Day? Yes, I did. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so it'll be Monday? Mon yes, next, this coming Monday. Okay. Monday the 7th uh, from 11 to 2. Again, that's 801 William Street, downtown Fredericksburg. Um, even if you don't come for the possum, come for the donuts. They are amazing. Stuart. <laughs> well, it sounds like we're winding down with the questions. Um, and I think you probably have your hands full there it looks like <laughs> i'd like to thank you so very much for such an informative presentation karen you did such a great job well and thanks for having me and i'm i'm glad i could be a, a guinea pig for you guys oh this is what a fun first, awesome. what a what a great topic for our very first zoom meeting thank you again and now you don't even have to worry about driving home. You're, you're already there. <laughs> that is the nice part. Yeah, it was gonna be about an hour to drive home. So, but the, the, but the sad thing is, you guys don't get to do selfies with Stuart. Well, well, we'll keep track of you. You have a Facebook page, right? I do, and I need to get on the ball and post, a, uh, we have some events that are coming up. I need to post on the website. Um, I post all the events as a, um, a Facebook event, so, some people like to follow on Instagram, but the best way to really keep track of the events and everything that's that's coming up uh, is actually Facebook, and that's just Awesome Possums, Possums with a Z. Um, and you can see pictures of baby squirrels, baby possums, anything else that flitters through my rehab area or my mind. It's uh, a bit of a rabbit hole. Yes, well, that's great to know, and we will keep track of you guys, and hopefully one day have you back when when we can actually get our selfies <laughs> definitely all right say goodbye Stuart. thank you thank you so much everyone for coming it was a really <laughs> fun fun event take care everybody i'm going to end the session bye, bye.